on today's show, we will be covering a season of transition and change. So stick around, coming at you next. What's up, everybody, and welcome to Crossfire Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Russ Dornish, and joining me today, as always, is, of course, the Reverend David Petty. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Russ? Not too bad. Not too bad. And also joining us today is our other co-host, Brian. Brian, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing pretty well. It's good to be back. Okay, yeah. So obviously we are going through, uh, it's summer right now, for those of you listening to this in the future, we are recording this here in the month of June, and we kind of got to talking and discussing and figuring out what we wanted to discuss on today's podcast, and something that kind of came up and really hammered home as far as what summer reminds us of, and kind of what a lot of stuff in our lives is going through right now, is that idea that uh, this time of the year sees a lot of transition and change. For example, we have um, middle schoolers going to high school, high schoolers transitioning to college, you know, kids changing from one grade to another. Within our lives, you might have job changes. Summer is the number one time for people to move. So you see a lot of people moving where they live, who their friends are, what's going on in their lives. Um, We ourselves are a Methodist group, and the Methodist church itself is going through a lot of transition and change, which is why we decided to kind of discuss this and talk about it, because we were talking about that transition and change. So I'm going to turn this around and poise the question and kind of discuss this with each of my hosts here. Uh, But David, let's, let's jump with you first. You know, change. Grief over loss of decisions. Um, You know, what is kind of your take on that? What are your thoughts on that? And of course, as the reverend of the group, what uh, what is your take uh, biblically as far as change and transition goes? Mm, mm. Yeah, there's um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot to pack into this. So first off, I would just say, you know, as a pastor, uh, I see people go through changes all the time, right? I, I, as a pastor, go through changes. We're an itinerant system, which means the pastors get moved all the time. Uh, and you really just have to expect that like life is not always going to be the same. And as much as we try to cling to that because we have a biological need for things to be the same, right? You know, we, I talked about this in a sermon recently that, uh, you know, probably for thousands of years, human beings have been benefited by being uh, skeptical of change and and relying on those patterns that we know and are comfortable with and the way that things are and have always been that we rely on those things because, you know, when you know that the berries grow on that side of the hill and the deer graze over here, you know where your food sources are. And suddenly if there's a major change, you know, a mountain uh, mudslide means that suddenly your food source is gone. Your, um, you know, the, the deer are gone, the berries are gone. Suddenly you don't have the ability to survive anymore. So we're very skeptical. We're very fearful of change. And yet we know that human beings have been adapting for millennia. So, uh, if not, you know, millions of years, however long, I don't know how long people have been here. Um, so the idea that we have to change and we have to learn how to change, uh, is nothing new. And some of it is about giving up the grief over the loss of what we think things ought to be like. Right. So uh, change. I love there was a description in a book that I read that said change is just your brain's experience of something new. So when something changes, we have to recognize we're experiencing something new and grieve the loss of the old. So uh, there's a lot of scriptures. I don't have one that comes to mind right now, but my my first thought is probably like the Ecclesiastes uh, that talks a lot about, you know, the the even in the midst of a variety of life situations that the best thing you can do is just to work the lot that you've been given and that they're, you know, that trying to make anything better than it currently is, is nothing more than chasing after wind. So I don't have a specific place, but just read all of Ecclesiastes. It talks about change all throughout there, but Brian, (laughs) what's your take on that? Well, yeah, I was, I was just looking at this, David, and, and one obvious one from Ecclesiastes is three verse one. You know, it's the the one that goes for everything. There's a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, 
time to plant, pluck up what's planted, a kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, etc., etc. It goes on for a while, but uh, it, it is a verse that uh, does talk about change. And Ecclesiastes, of course, does. Uh, I think I think you're exactly right that that's a good place to look. Yeah, I guess I just kind of forgot the most obvious one right there. <laughs> <laughs> about actual <laughs> seasons and change. You know, you know, that one. And it's probably because it gets so overused. You know, it's kind of like if you ask me a scripture about love, like Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 13 is probably not the first one I would try to come up with, but that is kind of the most common that people talk about. Um, Russ, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot. Obviously, I, I think, in, in all honesty, I think that the Bible has a ton of discussions and um, versus over change, because I think, like you said, we as humanity are constantly in a state of change. And it's obvious that our chemical makeup, the way that we are, the way that we were built, we just, like you said, I, I love that analogy of, you know, kind of going down to the basic instinct of, you know, what were our basic instincts when it came to change and how did that look? And that was a life or death situation. Nowadays, change most of the time does not include life changing issues that are life or death. Obviously, yes, we all go through, um, you know, losing people and that sort of change. But when it comes to, you know, the day to day, I mean, there's constantly things changing on a day to day. I can go and order food from my favorite restaurant and my favorite restaurants now closed. And I have to deal with that, like insignificant, you know, first world type of problem, but it's still a piece of change that I have to get used to. And now you kind of, I, I think about what the feeling is when that happens, when there's been something that I've really loved that is closed. You know, for instance, um, one of the first places that my wife and I went on a date in Denver was this really cool speakeasy bar. And I just found out it closed two months ago, not because they weren't doing well, um, but, you know, they were open for 12 years. They closed because some developers came in, bought up all the properties that was on that street and kicked them out. And they decided rather than moving, they they just, you know, wanted to end the experience of this really cool speakeasy. Um, and so, you know, we deal with that kind of stuff on a regular basis. And, you know, within the Bible, I can just think of a, a number of stories of obvious change. Uh, we could deal with, you know, obviously the idea in the story of Jesus is constant change for everybody around him. Um, having to deal with the loss of Jesus when that happened and then the disciples figuring out what they were going to do from there. That's probably the biggest example of change. But we can honestly find that in almost any story uh, that we read there. Which brings us kind of to where we're going next in this conversation. And obviously, not only are we a podcast, not only are we a group, uh, a Christian group, but we also are gamers. We love playing games. And I think one of the biggest story pieces, one of the biggest gameplay pieces that we've seen in the last two, three decades has been both games centered and revolving around change. But then you've also got the other side of change, which is the ability for you to make decisions and really change the way that the story is supposed to go. The developers give you the options to figure out what you want to do with the story. But then what's really great is unlike life, I can go back and play the game again and make different decisions and change the story and outcome for something completely different. When I think of that, I think of, you know, there's a very large um, contingency of games that are very story driven movie s kind of a choose your own adventure story you've got of course quantic dream kind of started that new trend uh with their games and then that's been kind of picked up by uh, i believe it's super massive games they're the ones that created uh oh shoot uh I can't until dawn. Sorry. Until dawn was their first game kind of came out of nowhere. This really cool, like choose your own adventure story, horror game. And they've been making, they've made like 10 of those since then. Um, and they're really cool because, you know, you kind of determine who's going to survive, who's going to live. Do you figure out who the, the, the killer is kind of like a Scooby-Doo choose your own adventure story, but a more adult version of it. Um, 
you know, those things are very interesting and fun things for gamers to be a part of. As far as change goes and changing in video games, uh, Brian, I'll let you go first. What are kind of your history examples, things that you've gone through? And, you know, what is it about games that allow you to do those things and be a part of that change that you appreciate as a gamer? Yeah, I might talk about, um, you know, there's several examples here. I'm going to steal one of yours here in a minute. Oh, just but, do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pentiment comes to mind as, as a recent example of a game where there were choices that caused changes. Um, and one where I thought as I was making the decision, I was like, you know, it'd be really interesting to go back and try this again. And see how it played out differently if I made a different choice here. Um, and I know another big one for me uh, was Knights of the Old Republic, uh, mm -hmm. the old RPG. And we could sort of dig into that in terms of morality as well and the choices you make and where they fall. Um, but that game had a lot of interesting decisions uh, that led to things playing out uh, in different ways. So it, it, you know, was really fascinating the way the story would evolve based on, uh, you know, your choices. Yeah. And David, um, I know you have a number of games that you've brought up that, you know, have a really good either morality system or, or deal with change in a different way. Um, what are, what are some of the games that come to your mind and, and how do you think that affects us as gamers? Why do you think we like games that are centered around that? Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to morality, um, I've always loved moral dilemmas. And I think that they are, you know, they are at the core, the dilemma of being human, right? That there are many situations, uh, right? It's, it's the Kobayashi Maru in, uh, in Star Trek, right? But it, it's that you're put into a situation where there is no winning, right? The trolley problem, the, uh, the dilemma that's proposed in, uh, the dark night, right? Where it's, if you blow up the other boat first, then you get to live. But do you believe that they are good enough not to blow you up? And how long do you hold to that belief? And I remember there was a point in Detroit Become Human where you're playing as this android robot and the other guy asks you to kill an android robot to prove that you don't have any feelings that the Android robot is alive. And if you do that, then he'll let you live. But like, there's not a really like, it's wrong to kill this robot, but you get to live, but it would not be good to like, and the same kind of thing. I mean, we see it in life is strange. Like there's all these different dilemmas that it's like, well, do you tell somebody that this thing has happened? And if you do, it might doom them, but it might be the right thing to do anyway. And like, um, mm -hmm. and so I think the reason we enjoy games like this, right. And, and we're talking about change is that in life, we don't get those options to have a redo. Right. And we're constantly probably wondering what if I could go back and I could change something because again, there's that grief, you know, what if I became a professional baseball player? I don't know. How would my life be different? Um, and it's kind of fun to tease that out and say, Okay, well, what if I did make that different decision? Um, you know, what story gets told? It's like a choose your own adventure story, right? You know, the, many years ago we had those books. You know, if you if you kill the robot, you turn to page seventeen. If you don't turn, kill the robot, turn to page eighty-two. Um, we like the idea of choosing our own adventure because we're a people who like choice. Um, I believe in freedom of choice, right? I believe in. Uh, the freedom that we choose our own destiny. I, I'm not a Calvinist. I don't believe in predestination. I believe in free will, which also means that we have the opportunity to make bad choices, right? Which sometimes can lead us down really hard changes uh, that that are not what we would hope for. But still, we are human beings that are that are made to be adaptive and changeable. And God is constantly remaking us over and over and over and over again. So I love the phrase, you know, God's not done with you yet, because I think throughout all of these changes that we experience in life, like God is doing something in us, whether we realize it or not through every change to eventually get us where we're going. So something you brought up that I want to kind of throw out there and see what you guys think that I literally just thought of. 
do you think that that is why we play video games in the first place? Is not only that ability to rewind and do something else, but the ability to be in control of something and to be able to manipulate something, whether that is a character, whether that is, you know, our favorite sports team, it's we're in control. So rather than, you know, change occurring, we get to manipulate and apply the change that we want to see. You know, I, I thought of that immediately, especially when you said the whole, you know, maybe one day, what if I was a baseball player? It's like, you can go play MLB the show and create your own player and play out his whole career and get to live through that vicariously. You know, uh, I think about, like I said, sports games and you're like, oh, my team made such a horrible trade. Here's what I would have done. Like, is that realistic? Could I do it? Would I win a championship by doing this? Okay, I can go in a video game, pop it in, do it, and now, oh, look, look where I am. Or like it is, it's it's the game of the hero. Like, you get to be the hero. You get to determine how he does it, whether you kill people or maybe you just subdue people or, you know, you sneak through the whole mission and you don't touch anybody. Like, Brian, do you think that that might be correlated and kind of tied into why we play games in the first place? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, there's actually a philosophy within game design circles called, uh, like like loosely paraphrasing, what is the player fantasy, right? So the mm -hmm. idea is, as a designer, as a game designer, you specifically target and imagine, like, what is the thing that the player wishes they could do in life, but, you know, for whatever reason, it, it might be completely impossible or it might just be something that like, you know, a, a lot of us dreamed as kids of being professional sports players, but you know, that's not possible for everyone to do that. Right. Like you, you mm -hmm. might work as hard as you possibly could. And you're still like just your natural God given talent isn't enough to get you there. Uh, or genetics. So there's, there or is this, <laughs> there is this philosophy of, of uh, you know, what is the player fantasy and specifically targeting like, you know, what is it, what is the wish that players want to fulfill and, and what choices then would they make if they were put in that position? Yeah, I, I want to bring in um, Jane McGonagall into the conversation. Um, sorry, my dogs are barking real loud out there. Um, any, any relationship to Professor McGonagall? No, no, I don't think so. But uh, so Jane McGonagall uh, has this book called Reality is Broken, uh, why games make us better and how they can change the world. Ooh. And in this book, she talks about the reason why people play games. Uh, and she kind of proposes six different uh, options of like why we play games. Um, one of which she talks about escapism, like just that, you know, reality sucks. And so you're trying to get away from it and you're trying to do something totally different. Um, one of which is meaningful work, Right, which I think then also goes with uh, number five, which is structured framework and feedback systems. I guess that's five and six. The idea that like sometimes you go to work and work is nebulous or it's confusing or it's challenging, and you know, but games offer you the opportunity to say, you know, you need to take this sword to the villager across the street. You're like, I can do that. This is easy. It's structured. I just get the sword, go to the villager, I get my coins. Right. This yeah. makes sense. Or it's meaningful. Um, and so she she says in the book about, that. Uh, think about uh, there there's some things that are kind of loosely games yeah. that I think fit that really well David like um uh the the pressure washing simulator and like lawn mowing <laughs> simulator and some of these other things right right you'd rather like, rather I, simulate it than actually mow your and lawn and I can be good at it right right um so she so she talks about meaningful work um, and epic wins, right? So the experience of epic wins mm. um, that, you know, you might not experience as much in life and then uh, social connection. But I think really that that structured framework, the meaningful work, um, you know, games often give us the ability to make meaning in much easier ways than real life does because real life is complicated and it's full of in-betweens and gray areas and spectrums. Um and, and sometimes games are just black and white, you know, just wash the barbecue. You're like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, we've kind of covered what change is, what we're all dealing with, with change. We talked about, you know, how the Bible relates to change, you know, video games, why we play video games. Um, my, my kind of 
last question to move into the final part of this conversation for both of you and, and kind of what I've been thinking throughout this is, you know, how do you think we can handle or deal with change better? You know, a lot of our listeners, if they're young, like I said, they're going to go through a lot of change right now, going to a new school. They're nervous. They're, they're, you know, unsure of what's to come. You know, if somebody out there is going through personal things in their life, if they're going through a move or a breakup or, you know, anything like that, what are some ways that you think that we can handle change better? And maybe, you know, just maybe some of that, a little bit of that is, you know, even if you're out there and you're not a gamer, maybe getting into games might help you deal with changes better. I kind of thought through this of like, maybe also video games can help train us to deal with change better. Um, and help, you know, develop our mind to not go completely freak out mode and instead, okay, can I train my mind to start doing problem solving mode and working mode and what should I do because of this change? David, what are your thoughts on ways that we can kind of affect that, go after that, deal with it, especially um, from a pastor's perspective, you know, that you deal with talking with a lot of people who are going through a lot of change? Yeah, um, I think that, that you know, just to jump back to Jane McGonigal here, her, uh, what she posits at the end of the book, the idea that games do make us better, right? Is games give us some of the tools and resources. They also empower us, right? With those epic wins. Like if we're having more wins in playing video games, we're going to have a more positive attitude when going out into the world and getting those little wins in the world, right? Where you might not get wins, meeting new friends at school. You might not get wins, you know, getting the perfect house when you move, you might not get wins, uh, that, you know, but you can get those little wins in games and games then teach you that you have something that you can do that you're in control of. Right. So you then take that attitude out of the games and say, you know what? I can create worlds. And the reality is, even though you might not think of it, the world around us is created by us, right? Like we put things, I put this little Jesus back here, right? I put him in the corner. If you're watching on YouTube, there's like a little Jesus stuffed animal that uh, my daughter gave me. I put him back here because I decided to create that. Uh, you have the ability to create a lot of the world around you. And so we get to choose our attitude, our perspective, and we get to choose if this is something that's happening to us or something that we have the opportunity to experience. Um, and the only difference between two types of stress, there's a good stress and there's a bad stress, right? Good stress is you stress, uh, EU stress, bad stress is distress, right? So you've got distress that is distressful. And often there are things that you feel like have happened to you that are distressful. You stress is stuff you get to do, right? If I said tomorrow you get to go to Disney world, you could go to Disney World and you would also sweat your socks off. You would have to walk like 10 miles in a day, but you would be excited to do it. Why? Because of your perspective. The only thing that changes from distress to you stress is your perspective on the situation. And that is something that you can change. So we can change to adapt to the changes around us and see those things in a better light. The other cool thing, last thing I'll leave you with is psychologically speaking, human beings are better at dealing with lots of negative changes or lots of changes all at once. Uh, and then spreading out your wins over time. So if you're going through a tough time and stuff feels like it's just all heaping up on top of you, be grateful that it's all happening around the same time so that you can get through it because you'll get through it. You'll get to another day and then you'll space out those wins over time. Right? So I know it's hard when you're going through a tough time to be grateful for the opportunity to experience that challenge, but we are born to be changeable, to be adaptable. And God is not done with you yet. Brian, what are, what are your thoughts on uh, change and kind of in summary of this conversation that we've had? Yeah, I want to tie into David's last point there, another verse that I looked up, which is Isaiah 43, verse 18. So it says, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I'll make a way in the wilderness and the rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people 
whom I formed for myself, so they might declare my praise. So just like in terms of that verse, thinking about how we talked earlier about regret of th- that we sometimes have of, you know, that maybe I made a certain decision. Um, but one of the things to keep in mind is that what David just mentioned is that we are a work in progress and that part of making that progress sometimes is the pain of a decision that we might think is wrong. Right. But that, uh, you know, to continue to go forward and to continue to better ourselves, right. And let God continue to work on us. That that's, I think really important. Yeah. And, and so, you know, as we kind of wrap up this conversation about change, um, I want to bring a call to action a little bit. I want to bring an invitation to those of you who are listening to this, you know, whenever it is, wherever it is, whatever you're doing, we're all going through change. There, there's never a time that I don't think we have something changing our life, but we all handle it differently. We all go through it differently. It might be a really minor thing. It might be a bigger thing and you're really struggling with it. We are inviting you and I invite you to create a new consistent and uh, kind of normal thing. Um, And that is what this group is for. So our Crossfire Faith Gaming Group, we meet regularly, we have conversations, we get to know each other, we have like-minded thoughts and ideas, we challenge each other in thoughts and ideas and things like that in a loving and graceful way. So my challenge and my invitation to you listening is if you're not already, you know, come join our Discord, hang out, have the ability to conversate online with people who love games, love God, love nerdy culture, uh, and and check out our Monday night hangouts that we do each and every Monday. Um, we have a lot of awesome uh, conversations. We do devotions. We talk about games we're playing. We talk about fun things. We just have fun community. And so if you're looking for kind of that common reoccurring community in your life, to get you through that change that you have right now, come on down to Crossfire Faith and Gaming. I'm going to change that up to an infomercial now. Uh, but but in all honesty, like we, we love you guys out there. We do this for you. We've created this community for you, and we want to be there for you. David and Brian, any last thoughts or uh, expansions on our invitation to talk about Crossfire? I've got one last thing, which is just to say that Whatever you're going through, if it is grief, if it is sorrow, if it is joy, if it is change that is hard or change that is easy, whatever it is that you're going through, you don't have to go through it alone. So at at discord.churchforgamers.com, you'll get the invite to our Discord channel. Reach out. There's people there. There's people you can talk to. There's people you can pray with. Uh, we're on there every Monday night at 8.30 on Mountain Time. Um, so I'm just this to expand Russ's invitation uh, that you are not alone and that we are here to walk this journey with you. So that's all I would say. Russ, why don't you wrap us up? Unless, Brian, did you have anything? You were kind of shaking your head no. All right. Russ, why don't you wrap us up? Okay. Well, thank you guys again so much for listening. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast uh, on your podcasting platform or subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell button so you're notified when we drop our podcast or Crossfire News on a weekly basis. We appreciate you guys so much. Uh, Make sure you guys come back next time. And thank you again to my co-hosts. Uh, I'm Russ Dornish for Crossfire News, signing off for Brian and David. We will see you next time. You are loved. You mattered. You belong. God bless, and we will see you later.